Hey guys, welcome to Treeline Church at Home. Uh, I want to encourage you to take some time to just unwind, relax, um, hop over to the chat and uh, stay engaged with people um, while we sit and we hear from God. Hey, good morning, Treeline family, and welcome to Church at Home. Uh, I hope you guys are having a great Sunday so far. As I talk about all the time, uh, worship, and we're going to jump into uh, worship this morning, uh, it's really just about putting all of our attention, all of our focus, all of our affection on Jesus. Uh, So whatever that looks like for you, maybe that's journaling, uh, maybe that's spending some time in prayer, uh, maybe it's singing with me this morning, whatever that looks like, um, let's just take a moment, let's approach the throne this morning with confidence and put all of our attention, all of our affection, uh, on Jesus. Let's, uh, let's sing together. Sing overwhelmed. Overwhelmed, but I won't break. Through the battle, I will say, Your grace will be enough. Your grace will be enough. Under fire, but we won't fall. We will never be alone, you'll always be enough, and he'll always be enough. Now in God we trust, in his name we hope, and I know my God will not be shaken. God is here with us, he's already won, and I know. My God will not be shaken, no, hey. See, we will follow, and we will follow where you go. We will trust through the unknown, and I know you go before, and I know you go before. Lead my heart now in your ways, for we're carrying your name and your promise. And come on, it's promise. Your promise never fails. Now in God we trust, in his name we hope, and I know God will not be shaken. God is here with us. He's already won. And I know God will not be shaken. My God will not be shaken. No, he won't. Oh. Hmm. Let's believe this. You finish. You finish what you've begun Forever strong in your love Your name is sure You will fight And you will fight for us Our hope forever secure In you alone You finish what you've begun Forever strong in your love your name is sure, and you will fight for us, our own forever secure, in you alone. Now in God we trust, in his name we hope, and I know my God will not be shaken, God is here with us, he's already and I know my God will not be shaken. My God will not be shaken. Thank you, Lord. Put our trust in you. Put our trust in you. Lord, we trust you this morning. We put our faith, our hope in you this morning. We love you.
to him before I spoke. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so kind to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. Yes, you did. You have been so, so kind to me. The overwhelming. And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. And oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Yeah. I love this part when I was your foe. When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. Yes, you did. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. And oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves at 99. And I couldn't earn it. And I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending Reckless love of God Yeah oh. believe this there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall, there's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. And oh, Chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves a 99, and I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away, and oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love.
we thank you, Lord. At this time, we're going to continue our worship through our giving. Giving is simply an act of worship to God. Just like we sing these songs to worship because we think God's amazing in response of what he has done in our lives, the extension of that is through our giving. That God tells us that he loves a cheerful giver. That we don't give out of guilt. We don't give out of obligation. We simply give to God because it's a response of what he has given us. The Bible teaches us so clearly that everything that we have, everything that we have, he has blessed us and given us. And so now our response is simply to give a portion back to him. So at this time, we're gonna take our tithes and our offerings. And there's a few ways that you can give here at Treeline. You can go to our website and you can give right there at treeline.church and there's a tab that you can give. You can also go to the Church Center app and download and there's a place right there within the app that you can give. We wanna say thank you for your generosity. Thank you for continuing to be a generous church. I know this season has been difficult and I know our county and our area has just gone green and we're looking forward to getting back together again with you soon but thank you for continuing to be generous to allow us to continue to be generous as a church in our community. Let's take some time to go over this week's announcements. You may have noticed that the weather's changing outside. Uh, it's summer and the team here is working on some big things for this summer. So keep your ears and eyes open for um, those announcements that are coming. The best way to stay up to date and informed about announcements coming from us is through our texting service. You can text TREELINE to 97000. You can also follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, head on over, smash those buttons for us. Now we're heading into the time for the message. Um, so like I said earlier, take this time to really be still. Um, and listen to what God's speaking to you uh, and stay engaged in the, in the comments section. Um, let's hear what God has to say. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I've always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please won't you be my neighbor? Hi, neighbor. I hope you were able to sing along with that intro. If you're from Pittsburgh, you know how much of a local treasure Mr. Rogers is to us here in his home city of Pittsburgh. Matter of fact, there's a statue of him built on the North Shore by the football and baseball stadium. You know how much people here love and really treasure Mr. Rogers. And honestly, for me, I can really echo that sentiment. He was someone that I really looked up to as a child. Matter of fact, you could ask my family and they would tell you that if Mr. Rogers was on the television, Brian was sitting in front of the TV. 
I just learned so much from him and just as many kids my age just learn so much. Matter of fact, across multiple generations, just really look forward to that time, Mr. Rogers being on the TV. And one of the things that I really appreciated about him is that he was willing to tackle the difficult subjects. There was nothing really taboo or it was off limits with Mr. Rogers. He really went there. Even with us as kids, he was able to talk about difficult situations in such a way that helped us understand. And I know in our world and everything going on in our culture right now, there's some really difficult things going on. We see all of the injustice. We see the racism that's taking place, all of the rioting, all of the protests, all of the unrest, the difficulty, the pain that people are going through. And honestly, it feels very overwhelming. And maybe like me, you've been not sure how to process that. What's the right thing to say? What's the wrong thing to say? How does it make me feel inside? And maybe you're somebody or the person of color who's really struggled with this because it just seems like one more thing, one more thing to add to the list of the injustice that happens in our nation. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a time to talk about this in this new series, Won't You Be My Neighbor? And I love what Mr. Rogers had to say. If you've seen the movie, Won't You Be My Neighbor, made about Mr. Rogers, I encourage you to take a look. It's an incredible movie. But he says this quote, and he says that the greatest evil of all is when we make someone feel less than they are. The greatest evil is when we make someone feel less than they are. And that's really at the root of what racism is. And as we jump into the series, and I'm going to start to unpack this, and, and I don't know, maybe right away you're ready to engage in this. Like, like me, you've been researching and trying to listen and learn, and you're, and you're eager to open your heart and your mind to have this discussion. Or maybe you've been a little bit hesitant. You're not quite sure if you want to get into this conversation, or you see things that you don't like or identify with, or having a struggle or a hard time wrapping your head around, and so you feel a little closed and guarded. I just want to encourage you, and I want to start off this series by telling you what the series is not. See, the series isn't about picking sides. It's not about a political party. It's not about being on the left and the right. Matter of fact, it's not about who's right or wrong at all. That's not what this is about. I'm not a black person. I'm not a minority. I'm just a white guy. I'm a white pastor living in the suburbs, and so I can't specifically speak to the situation the way that some people may. And matter of fact, even as a white person, I can't speak for all white people. I can only speak for myself and my experiences. So what is this series about? Well, I want to have an honest conversation. I want to begin to to talk about this because I think we would be doing it an injustice as Christ followers if we don't talk about the things that are going on in our world, if we don't talk about the injustice and the things and the part that we play as Christ followers. That We can't be insulated from the culture and just pretend that it doesn't exist, but that we've got to take a look at what's going on in our world and on inside of our hearts. And so this series is really about what does the Bible have to say? What was the example that Jesus left for us? What did it look like when he was here on the earth? How did he react with and interact with people who were different from him? And see, really what it comes down to is what is my response as a Christ follower? Now, if I can just be transparent and, and honest with you, as things have progressed and as things got really bad the last couple of weeks, I really started to look inside of myself because I began to grieve and I began to feel this frustration and this, this overwhelming feeling of helplessness, of feeling like I, I don't like these injustices. I don't like what I'm seeing going on in front of me. I'm really struggling with how to respond. I have black friends who are close to me and other black pastor friends who I really look up to and admire. And I didn't want to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. Or, or, or not know what to do and just feeling almost a little paralyzed, a little bit helpless and really honestly quite sad. And so I really want to take us on this journey and just to be honest with you, and I hope this is a place that you can get to, I realized that I just simply had to start with me. That it wasn't about trying to say the right thing. It wasn't trying to say the wrong thing. It wasn't just about trying to change someone's mind or convince someone or or try to do something online or whatever it was. I just simply had to start with me. I had to look on the inside of what's going on in my heart. How can I take ownership of my actions, of my reactions, of the way that I interact and treat people? And really, as I begin to break this down, something that really began to jump out to me, something that I want to understand, and I hope that you can understand as well is that even though I told you those are some of the hats that I wear and the labels that I have that I'm, I'm a white guy, that I'm, I'm a pastor and I'm, I'm a dad, I'm a husband and those are some of the labels and the things that I do but here's what I want us to get. That's not my identity. 
See, when I said yes to a relationship with Jesus, my identity ceased to exist in just those things, and those are all part of who I am. But see, my identity is truly in Christ. And when you've said yes to a relationship with Jesus, that is your identity. It's not about being white or black or Latino or Asian or, or any other ethnicity. It's simply saying that, or even a man or a woman, that our identity is in Christ. Matter of fact, we can see this echo, this exact sediment in the book of Galatians 3.28. It says there is no longer Jew or Gentile. Basically Jews, they were saying there are Jewish people and there's Gentiles, which is everyone else. So they're saying it doesn't matter. It's not just Jew or everyone else. They're not just slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. See, friends, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we are one. We have come under the identity, under the banner of God's children. That when we say yes to relationship with him, the Bible is so spells it out so clearly that we are his sons and his daughters. We are his adopted children. We are heirs to his kingdom. We, are, we have come up underneath him, and that is where our identity lies. And so I think it's really important that we start with that idea. And see, for us as Christ followers, our, our worldview, our experience, should be a little bit different. Why? Because we were all created in the image of God. We all have a little bit of the image of God inside of us. And because of that, we believe that life is valuable, that life is precious, that every single person, every human life has worth, has value because of who God is, because God created us in his image. And so we've really got to start there. And so as we unpack this and we begin to talk about this, this idea of, of racism still being alive and well in our country, we got to start with this idea of what racism is. And, and true racism is just believing in racial superiority. It's believing that race determines your intellect. It determines your cultural or moral capacities. And really from that comes the practice of racism. Racism involves racial prejudice, it's, it's bigotry, it's discrimination against others based simply upon their race or their ethnicity. See, it's simply that idea, and here's what we really got to understand, is racism is evil. Friends, racism is sin. What is a sin? Sin is something that simply separates us from God. It's living outside of the will or the way that God wants us to live. And God has made it so clear that his desire for us is not to live in this way, to not have racist thoughts or ideas, or not live our life thinking that we are superior to anybody else. Matter of fact, racism betrays the heart of God. See, when we understand we are God, when we were created in God's image, racism basically elevates myself in saying that the amount of God or the image of God in me is more important or is greater than that it is in you. And see, that betrays the heart of God. That is not God's heart. He doesn't believe that any of his children matter more or more important or more superior in any way. We are all God's creation. Matter of fact, when it really comes down to it with race, there is only one race, the human race. And there are all different kinds of shades, which are beautiful, that God has created. That God has created us all differently, uniquely. We can celebrate and come together and celebrate those that diversity diversity that he has given us and that he has created. So as we begin to unpack this, a story that I want to share with you this week is one that's pretty popular. And really, when it comes to this topic, a lot of people will broach this, they'll talk about it, it'll be a, a text that you might hear often. And it's really from the, um, it's from Luke 10. And it's a story about Jesus, who at this point in his ministry, and he's here time on the earth, he is teaching. And he's getting some attention for it, because people are like, man, Jesus, and this guy really knows a lot. He really knows a, a lot about God. He knows a lot about the, the kingdom of God. He knows a, a lot about our history and all of our scripture up to this point. He, he really knows what's going on. And so people would come and sit and listen to hear what Jesus had to say. And so at this particular time, he's sitting and he's teaching. And one of this religious experts, someone who really knew a lot about the law, the things that they had to follow to be someone who was following after God, a good God follower, had to do all these things and all these rules and live under these things. And so the expert in the law comes to Jesus and asks a question. So he starts in verse 25 and he says, one day an expert in the religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? 
The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. Basically, you've got to live for God. You've got to put God first in every single area of your life. And then secondly, love your neighbor as yourself. Did you catch it? First commandment, love God with everything that you are, everything that you've got. And then secondly, you've got to love your neighbor like you do yourself. Jesus answered, right, do this and you will live. And then the man wanted to justify his action. So he's a follow-up question. He says this. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Basically, who is it that I need to love? If I'm loving God with all I got, and I don't have any questions about that, right? That makes sense as someone who's following after God that I'm going to put God first in every area of my life. But you're saying that I've got to follow and love, follow God and love my neighbor. But who is my neighbor? Basically asking the question, who, who do I have to love? Who do I have to care for? And so Jesus being just the master of this, he, he tells a story, tells a parable to illustrate the point that he's trying to make. So starting in verse 30, he says this, Jesus replies with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him for dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. So uh, think of it like in the modern terms, a pastor, a, a priest at a Catholic church, someone who was serving God in a vocational role, right? This was their job to be serving God, to be taking care of people. So this priest comes along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant, someone also who'd been working for a church, maybe it was someone working there who should have also been following after God. You think they would do the right thing, but it says the temple assistant walked over, looked at him lying there, but then he also passed him by on the other side. I mean, these guys, think about it. They don't even just see him. They like cross the road to get to the other side to get as far away as possible. Don't make eye contact, right? We'll just pretend that we didn't see this guy laying there, beaten, needing help on the ground. But then the story continues. Then a despised Samaritan came along. Now just pause there for a moment. A despised Samaritan. Here's what you've got to understand contextually what's going on here historically. See, the story is about a Jewish man. And Jewish people and Samaritan people were like oil and water. They did not mix. Matter of fact, Jewish people felt that they were superior in every single way to Samaritans. They considered them a half-breed. They were only partially Jewish. They were from Samaria. Matter of fact, Samaritan parents, I mean, Jewish parents would have taught their kids that Samaritan people were less than human, that they, they didn't count for anything. They were terrible. They were outcast by God. They didn't deserve to even be in the same category as them. And so here's what's amazing about this story, right? The first two people who would also have been Jewish, who would also been the same nationality of this guy, they walk away. But then here's where we come to the despised Samaritan. It says, he came along and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins telling him, take care of this man. If his bills run higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. And then Jesus poses this question to the religious leader who was asking him this. He says, now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits? The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. See, I love what Jesus does here. He totally takes people out of their comfort zone and makes them, maybe makes them squirm a little bit. Because maybe the question that this guy was asking him was, maybe, who can I get away with not being my neighbor? I mean, see, loving my neighbor is easy as long as it's someone that I care about, someone I agree with, someone I identify with. See, that's where it could become really easy to say, yeah, I'm really in this. They're, they're my neighbor. I can care for them. I can love them like myself. But Jesus tells a story and says, hey, the person who should have been the one who... who we would have said, hey, they had every right to walk away. Jewish people treat them terribly. I mean, they treat them like dogs. I mean, they just treat them like the scum of the earth. They don't won't even talk to them. They don't want to associate with them. They just think that they're so much better. But the person who went out of their way in this story was someone who probably would have made them very uncomfortable. 
someone that actually looked down on them, someone who they decided to help and see this is so much at the heart of God. When we begin to understand that our neighbor is everyone, basically the story, the answer Jesus is wanting them to get is that your neighbor is everyone, even the people who you don't think are worthy of your mercy and your compassion. See, this is the center of the gospel. This is the center of God's heart and his creation for us. That when we ask this question, won't you be my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And Jesus is saying pretty much everyone, even the people that you don't like, and even the people who you think might not like you. That that's our responsibility to see them as our neighbor. And so as we begin to break down and have this discussion, understand God's heart and his idea that the love that he has for us that must flow to others as our neighbor, and we begin to have this discussion about racism that's taking place in our country today, I know it can become a little bit uncomfortable. And I can imagine this religious leader as he's sitting and hearing Jesus tell this story, he might have just maybe just pulled back and withdrew a little bit, feeling a little bit uncomfortable with what he's talking about. Maybe as we begin to talk about racism, you can feel yourself withdraw a little bit maybe closing your heart, your mind a little bit, but I just want to encourage you to just open up your mind, open up your heart as we have this discussion. Just like Jesus challenged them, he is still challenging us today in our perceptions that we have of others. See, when we talk about racism, it can really happen in two fronts. It can happen individually or it can happen institutionally. And we're going to talk more on individually, but see, on the institutional front, what you've got to know for minorities and specifically for black people living in America, that if you are black living in our country, you are less likely to get a quality education. You are less likely to get a high paying job. You are less likely to live in a fluent neighborhood with low crime rates. And friends, that is just a fact. And often institutionalized racism is at the center of that, helping that happen. And see, we're not going to really dive too much into that, but I really want us to unpack and begin to understand what individual racism is all about, and specifically the shadow side of racism. See, when you begin to hear about racism, you begin to hear about crimes against people who are different or different ethnicities or different races, we can just begin to say that we don't believe in any of that. Matter of fact, we hear stories of the Holocaust and we're horrified. We're like, I don't support Hitler and what he did. That's, that was pretty terrible. I, I, don't, I don't agree with, you know, people who are white supremacists. I, I don't believe in any of that. I, I don't hate people of color. I've never said bad things to them. I've never committed acts of violence towards them in any way. Matter of fact, you would probably go as far as say, I don't have a racist bone in my body. But friends, what if it's not about bones? What if it's about something that's a little bit more subtle? Maybe it's a little bit more about the shadow side of racism. What if it's about ideas or thoughts that we have? What if it's about subtle actions or feelings or reactions that we have in a moment? See, racism is not a label, but we have to see racism as actions in a moment. See, in his book, Dr. Ibram Kendi wrote a book called Anti-Racist, talking about not enough to be not a racist, but he's talking about encouraging us to be against racism. And he says this about being racist. He said, it's not a fixed term. It's not an identity. It's not a tattoo. It is describing what a person is doing in the moment. And people change from moment to moment. Simply put, that racism today for pe most people is completely different than it was during the Civil War of slavery. It's completely different than it was in the era of the Jim Crow law. See, racism might look different because it's not just simply about putting a label and blaming and calling someone a racist. It's about our actions and our motives and our thoughts and our ideals in that moment. See, this is really about shadow racism, and it can rear its head in anyone's life at any time. And so I think it's important that we talk about this and begin to unpack about what this looks like. And you might be asking yourself, well, what, what, what is shadow racism? What does that look like? And just to share a few examples for you of what that can look like as we begin to examine our lives and our hearts and starting with us, say you're an employer and you get four applications for a job 
and you get four applications, one's from Brett, one's from Emily, one's from Jamal, and one's from Tierra. You get these applications, they are all four equally qualified, they all have the same education qualifications are met, they all have the right education, they have all the right experience, they got all that, check the boxes, all of the recommendations are glowing, everything is great on all four of these applications. But then somewhere, as you are making the decision on who you're going to follow up and interview, you decide simply that you're going to interview Brett and Emily and not Jamal and Tierra. Why? Just based on the names, that two names sound like they could be white and two names sound like they probably pretty much are black. And so when you read that and you make the decision, this is where shadow racism comes. It's making a prejudgment based on someone's name, on their likability, on their capability, on their value, and on their worth, and what they would be like on the team. Why? Simply based upon their name. And I know that sounds like that could be crazy and who could ever do this, but there have been studies over and over that shown that this is the case in our country today. It's shadow racism. It's those simple, small ways that racism manifests in our life today. The same thing can be true when it comes to dating and marriage. That how, what is your feeling? What is your thoughts? When you see a black man with a white woman in a dating relationship or even marriage, wh- how do you feel? What are the feelings that you feel in that moment? Do you feel that it's wrong? Does it make you angry? Does it make you upset? Does it make you a little bit uncomfortable to see it? Because here's what we've got to know. There is absolutely nothing wrong with interracial marriage. It's not something that God looks down upon. It's not something that's wrong. There's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. So you have to ask yourself the fee question, how does it make you feel? I mean, honestly, is there something going on in your heart? Is there something that going on in your feelings that would say that there's some shadow racism going on because you're not okay with it? And now here's what's crazy about this. This is nothing new. This is not something new to America or to our unique Western culture. This has been going on pretty much forever. Matter of fact, in the Bible, there was a great leader, a great man of God who did these amazing works, these amazing works, amazing things for God, just did these crazy signs and wonders. Everything just was an incredible leader. But then he takes a wife who is not of the same race of him. And then all hell breaks loose. People rebel against him. Matter of fact, his own brother and sister make a stand against him and say, this is wrong. You shouldn't be doing this. If you're drawing a blank on who this is, it's Moses. Moses actually marries a Cushite woman who were known for their dark complexion skin, that they were known for being of a different race. And Aaron and Miriam, Moses' own brother and sister, take a stand against him. And God goes out of his way to say, you know what, Aaron and Miriam, you're wrong about Moses. There is nothing wrong about this marriage. See, the same thing happens today, that there could be shadow racism that manifests itself in our life. This next one can be kind of devastating, and it really happens based on assumptions. See, a few years ago in the news, there were four teens, and they were in Wynn, Arkansas, and they were all four black males, and they were on a sports team, and they were raising funds, and they were in a community going door to door, and they were trying to raise funds legitimately for their sports team. And so they're walking through this community, just joking with each other, and the next minute they know they're all four on the ground with a white lady holding a gun on them, calling the police. Well, the police arrive, they get there, they ask the woman to please put her gun away, and they ask her why they pulled this, she pulled this gun on them, why they called the cops, and she simply answered, well, they're black and this is a white community. See, friends, and I know too many painful stories like this, even in my own life personally, where I have personally witnessed assumptions happening, and that, my friend, is shadow racism. That's something we've got to examine our heart. Do we make assumptions about people simply based on the color of their skin? Friends, that is wrong. Something that also happens is something called pseudo acceptance. And this is where we don't fully invite or fully, um, we don't fully accept people for who they are. It's like inviting someone to a party, but then not asking them to dance. It's saying, hey, I, I'll be, it's, I'm okay to be around you, but I don't fully trust you to engage into a, a really life-giving relationship, right? I don't know that I could completely trust you with your kids, just simply based upon the color of your skin. See, friends, simply having pseudo acceptance for people on the outside might look like that I'm okay with people of different races, but it really comes to getting into a close relationship or trusting them. See, it really can show that something is going on inside of our heart. 
And the last one, and probably the most important for us today, is what's going on in our family life. Parents, what are we modeling for our children? What do our kids hear us say when the evening news is on? What do they hear us saying when we're scrolling through those articles and we're scrolling through social media? What do they hear us say when we're out driving in traffic or when we're out shopping at the mall? See, what are they witnessing us say and do? See, this is a really big deal because I, I, you, what we've got to know is that none of us were born with the capacity to hate and to be racist. It's very much something that we picked up and learned along the way. Matter of fact, there's a band who I really enjoy, someone that has been pretty much a soundtrack for my life. It's a band called Switchfoot. And their latest album, the title track, is called Native Tongue. And a native tongue is someone that just, it's your natural language. It's the tongue that you were born with, like the country, like my native tongue would be English. That's what I speak. But see, they put a, a little spin on it. And they say that basically in the lyrics of this song that everyone's native tongue is love. None of us are born knowing how to hate. No one is are born knowing how to discriminate against others. That's something that we pick up. And their cry for the song is that I want the world to sing in its native tongue. See, friends, we've got to understand the responsibility that we have as parents, that we have to impress upon them, that we can really easily and maybe not even intentionally impress this shadow racism upon them. What are they hearing you say? What are they seeing you do? What are the actions that they're seeing you take? What are the off-the-cuff jokes or the comments that you're saying that they may pick up upon and may make an impression upon their young, impressionable hearts? Friends, I hope that you hear me say this and help us to understand that this is something that can happen to anyone. That this isn't about being a bad person or being labeled as a racist, but it's just about what happens in the moment. And here's something that's got to be especially true that we've got to catch, is that racism is not just simply about white to black. It very well could be from white towards blacks or blacks to whites or blacks towards Hispanics or Hispanics towards Asians or whites towards Hispanics. There's, there's unlimited combinations of where this can go and how it can manifest itself. So as we begin to unpack this this week, and we have so much more to talk about in the coming weeks, we have so much more to unpack and talk about and really get into. But today, I just want to leave you with a couple of thoughts, some practical things. What can we do? Maybe you're sitting here, you're hearing this today. Maybe you're a white person like me and you're hearing this and you're saying, what are some of the things that I can do? What are some of the things that I can respond? And maybe whatever, whatever race, whatever your skin color is, there's some things that we can begin to do right now to begin to take this on. It's our response as Christ followers. The first one is this. Simply start by searching your own heart and repenting where necessary. See, so much more important than getting on to social media before making your voice heard, but you're trying to change everyone else's heart, change everyone else's mind. We've simply got to start with us. We've got to be introspective. We've got to search our heart. We've got to ask God, which ways has this affected me? What ways has shadow, maybe it's one of these things that we talked about with shadow racism, and maybe what's one of those things that you've had to deal with or you recognize in your own heart. Maybe it's something we didn't mention here, but you've got to just begin to examine your heart. And this is what I've been doing this week. I've just been asking God and in my worship and my prayer time, just, guys, search my heart. What are the things that I have been doing? What are the things that I received growing up or the things that I was maybe around or culturally had an impact on me that are not of you, that may in subtle ways, not, not being a white supremacist or a skinhead or a neo-Nazi, but just even in simple, small ways, God, that just dishonor you because you desire for us to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's a commandment that you have given us. We've got to start with us. The second one is this, and it's really important. Friends, we've got to commit to listening. We have got to commit to listening. We've got to hear other people's stories, other people's experiences. See, it might be easy for us to say that something's not true, that something doesn't exist, that things are not as bad as we make them out to be, and things are being blown up out of proportion. But see, we've got to take the time and listen. We've got to educate ourselves. We've got to learn about our brothers and sisters in Christ and what they're going through and the battles that they face. We've got to stop talking so much, and we've just got to listen more. Matter of fact, I'm really excited for next week. We're going to sit down and have a conversation with Pastor Justin Morell, who's one of my friends, and he's a black pastor here in Pittsburgh. And we're going to sit down, and we're going to have an honest conversation together. And we as a church are going to listen. Friends, we've got to listen. We've got to listen more. 
The third one is this, we've got to choose to forgive. This is at the heart of who God is, that God loved you and I so much that he chose to forgive us. And the Bible tells us that because he has forgiven us, we can forgive others. So I don't know what you've experienced. I don't know what's been done to you. I don't know what experience or racism or injustice that you have experienced, but we've got to choose to forgive. And I know that is easier to say than be done. I have not been the person who has received racism on my end very much. I haven't lived with systematic racism and, and had to really push through that. It's not been my experience, but there has been other areas of my life where people have wronged me in very deep and meaningful and painful ways. And I know how difficult it is to choose to forgive. But friends, as Christ followers, we've got to choose forgiveness. The last one is this, and I love this. We've got to be intentional to build relationships with people outside of our own ethnicity. I love this. And I know for us here in Pittsburgh, we're not quite as diverse as some of the other parts of the country or other cities, but we also have people of different nationalities, that we have people of beautiful cultures that have differences that we can come to know and love and learn and embrace. And I don't know if you're black, if you're white, if you're Asian, if you're Hispanic, it doesn't matter. I want to encourage you and challenge challenge you to step outside of what you are comfortable. Friends, I want you to know that some of the most deep and meaningful relationships that I've had in my life in different seasons have been people who have looked very different than me, who have had skin color very different than mine, who've had upbringings and experiences and culture differences very much different than my own, and that just only served to enrich my life and grow the depth and the beauty of my relationship in Christ. We've got to develop relationships, intentional relationships and friendships with people that look different than us. Now, I know those might be hard, four hard things to do, and I know any one of those would be difficult. But friends, I believe that we've got to have these difficult and maybe uncomfortable conversations. And I just want to let you know that if talking about racism, if talking about this, if this makes you uncomfortable, that's okay. It's okay to feel uncomfortable. It's okay to not quite know how to feel about it. Maybe this pushes against the grain with how you're raised and not really have had conversations. I was sharing with a pastor friend this week as we were preparing this message to share. I said, I, I don't feel qualified and pretty much uncomfortable to be talking about racism as a white pastor in the suburbs of a predominantly white city. But see, we've got to have these conversations. We've got to use our voices. We've got to break through and push through the uncomfortableness We've got to push through the awkwardness and have loving, intentional conversations. Friends, I hope you will join us as we continue this series over the next couple of weeks. I really hope that you will open up your heart and your mind and start to examine your own heart. Let's be the church. Let's be the body of Christ together. And let's tackle this and have this honest conversation together. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you right now in your mighty name. God, we recognize all the difficulty, all the unrest, all the pain, all the uncertainty happening in our culture, in our world, in our cities right now. God, we just bring it and lay it all at your feet. And God, beyond everything else that's going on, Lord, we ask that you would start with us. God, as Christ followers, as people who have committed their lives to following after you, God, before we try to get anything else right, before we try to change anyone else's hearts or minds, God, we would be committed to seeing our own hearts changed. God, I pray that our hearts would be vulnerable. They would be soft and pliable before you. God, that we'd be able to have honest conversations with each other. God, I just pray, Lord, for unity to be built. And God, I just even pray for Treeline to be a place of unity where people People of different nationalities can come, people of different races, different backgrounds, different socioeconomical backgrounds, whatever it is, God, that they can come and know that this is a place that we can have honest conversations and love and embrace our differences. God, I thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Friends, as we're wrapping up here today, we want to give you the opportunity to do the best thing that you could possibly do. See, just as we were talking about those two commandments that God has given us that Jesus himself highlighted, he said, love your God with all that you've got and then love your neighbor as yourself. The greatest thing that you can do to show your love for God is to surrender your life to him. 
See, it's not about just simply doing the good enough things and saying that if I do enough good things and I'll outweigh my bad deeds, and then God will love me and he'll accept me and I can have a relationship with him. <laughs> it takes all the pressure off of us. It's not about doing the right things. It's not about saying the right things or looking like you're a church person or a Christian. It's simply surrendering, saying, God, I need you. I can't do this on my own. I'm not good enough. I'm a mess. God, I just need you to come into my life. Friends, if that's you, if you're a mess, if your life has just been broken down, if you've been uncertain, if you just know that you can't do this on your own, maybe the pain, the confusion, and maybe it's been like that for a while, and maybe everything going on in our society and the world with coronavirus and now the, all the civil unrest, and you're just left sitting here wondering, what is this all about? What am I supposed to do? Friends, I want to encourage you. The best thing you can do is to give your life to Jesus. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is just simply pray with me and repeat after me. There's no magic, there's no special words to say. It's just simply saying this and believing it in your heart. Just repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I believe in you. Come into my life. Make me brand new. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to follow after you every day of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, if you said that prayer, we believe that they are throwing a party in heaven right now in your honor. Matter of fact, it says that if one person comes to a relationship with Jesus, all of heaven is rejoicing. If you said that prayer and you meant it in your heart, we wanna help you make some next steps. If you would simply text the word rejoice to 970-00, we just wanna come alongside of you and help you make some next steps becoming a lifelong follower of Jesus. Friends, if you have any questions, and I know as this stirs up in this topic that we're talking about, maybe making a decision for Christ or some of the things that God's doing inside of you or you just need prayer because things are difficult, please don't hesitate to reach out. Please don't hesitate to shoot the text or send us an email or send us a message on social media and let us know how we can be there and how we can be a support for you during this time. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Looking so much forward to talking about this and having this conversation with you over the next couple of weeks. Have a great rest of your day. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't take down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't take down, coming after me. And oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. And oh, he chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh. Thanks again for joining us for Church at Home. Uh, just a reminder, there's no church lobby this week, unfortunately, but stay tuned for other opportunities to connect in the coming weeks.